masters that we have prayed for this speaker. And we thank God he did not refuse. No? And uh, remember, we are in this together. And uh, we thank God for this man. Um, I have met a lot of missionaries, and among that I admire is uh, this uh, man who has uh, really had a part uh, to serve, a humble part. Kahit na po Americano, hindi siya, you cannot see arrogance in his uh, ministry. He's always uh, uh, having that uh, uh, recognition of uh, peers, and uh, you know, I appreciate uh, the ministry of uh, our main speaker, who's been uh, president of High Acres Come for many years, and uh, at the time I'm his treasurer, I'm the one spending the money <laughs> for the camp. But uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, the ministry of uh, Pastor Lloyd Baker, who was at one time interim become an interim pastor in Bethany Baptist Church. I still remember the time because I was about to graduate at the time from my engineering course when uh, Mom, um, Pastor Baker and Mom Edith Baker were there with us in Bethany during the time of Paul of uh, the late uh, Laura Lapas Usli. So, folks, uh, let's all stand and help me welcome uh, Dr. Lloyd Baker. Let's give him a big hand. And he's calling her Pastor Baker. Good evening. Good evening. I may be seated. Well, it's good to see you tonight. This is a really good crowd to start off. And uh, I'm glad that you made the sacrifices to come and be at the adult camp this year. I have missed uh, several adult camps. Sometimes I was in the States, but uh, it's good to be back again. I appreciate the tremendous work that uh, Brother Nobley has put in over the years in High Acres. He has given his heart life in uh, boosting the camp, encouraging others to have a part in it, and uh, this tabernacle is a result of that. I think it was in 2003, maybe 2002, uh, we had a pastor's retreat here, and it was really a, a good retreat, and uh, Brother Bob Baird was one of our speakers, and we were uh, raising money for uh, a new tabernacle and uh, Brother <coughs> came to me afterwards and he said uh, I tell you what if the churches and the pastors in the Philippines will raise $25,000 then I will raise $25,000 in the states it took us three years and we kept it in the bank and I kept watching it grow and one day it hit $25,000 and I got on the phone and I said, Brother Bear, we have the 25000 Now please send your 25000 <laughs> And he did. And that was the beginning of this new tabernacle. The old one was in pretty sad shape. This one is nicer and bigger and better. And so we praise God for, uh, in, in this instance, it was 50-50. 50, 50, 50 Filipino and 50 Americano. And we appreciate them, and we appreciate all the folks here who gave sacrificially. Well, Brother Nobley tells us that this is a time of relaxation. And uh, it's uh, no rush, 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 rush. Slow and easy. And I guess that means I can preach two hours. <laughs> you don't like that? Amen. <laughs> I'll cut 10 minutes off. How about that? <laughs> We're going to talk about uh, intimacy on tonight, tomorrow night, and Wednesday night. Our subject will be intimacy. Now, tonight we're going to talk about spiritual intimacy. And tomorrow night we're going to talk about psychological intimacy. And Wednesday night, we're going to talk about physical intimacy. Brother Raffi is here, and he asked me uh, 
some time ago, uh, what are you going to preach on? So I told him, spiritual intimacy, psychological intimacy, and physical intimacy on Wednesday. He said, I'll be there Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad he's here tonight. <laughs> now, you know, people will spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money to learn about physical or sexual intimacy. However, I think they neglect the nurturing of spiritual and psychological values in their life. Values that I think will help physical intimacy. And I'm talking about such values as caring and loving and sharing and responsibility and commitment. Now I'd like to ask one more question. We found out how many people were married. How many of you married folks, both husband and wife, are present tonight? Raise your hand. That's a good number. Amen. Thank you very, very much. So we need to learn about spiritual and psychological intimacy. And that's what I hope that we will learn this week. And I hope that it will be a blessing and that when you go down the mountain, back to your home, back to your ministry, back to your job, that you will carry something with you that will be of interest and benefit to you for the rest of your lives. Now we're going to start out with the basics of intimacy. I want to talk to you about what makes up intimacy and what is it. Intimacy is sharing your deepest and closest feelings with someone else. Someone has said that the word intimacy can be divided into three words. In, to, me, see. And to me see. Or uh, see into me. That's what intimacy really is. It's being open, especially between a husband and a wife, so that you can see into each other's hearts. You know and understand what each one needs. Intimacy occurs when you look into each other's hearts and see all the desires and dreams of your marriage partner. <coughs> In marriage, intimacy means sharing all you are and all that you have with your spouse. Intimacy is opening yourselves to each other completely. You're not uh, holding back anything. Wholeheartedly in every area of your life. A successful marriage is one in which a couple spend their entire life drawing closer to each other and learning about each other. And I honestly believe that it takes a lifetime to do that. My wife and I have been married 54 years. And every once in a while she will surprise me and I learn something about her that I didn't know these 54 years. <laughs> so the longer you're together, the more you know each other, the better chance you have of, of experiencing physical uh, and spiritual intimacy. Spiritual intimacy is the act of consistently and intentionally coming together before the face of God to know Him in a much more intimate way. It is seeing and knowing God together. Unfortunately, however, according to a book written by Neil Clark Warren, only 10 to 15 percent 
of married couples know what true spiritual intimacy is all about. Mm. I think that's a tragically low number. There is nothing that is more significant and more rewarding than a husband and a wife working together to embrace God and to seek His face for their marriage and their family. I can think of nothing more important in the life of anyone, and especially a Christian couple, than learning spiritual intimacy with God. Amen. Husband and wife and God walking together in fellowship and intimacy. I believe that Adam and Eve knew something about spiritual intimacy in their marriage. Let me show you what the Bible says about this from the book of Genesis. So go back in your Bibles, please, to Genesis chapter 1. Now, when Moses wrote the first and second chapters of Genesis, he did not do it in chronological order. As you read the chapters, you'll see that he mentioned one thing and proceeds on, and then later he'll come back to that one thing and add something to it. So we're going to try to put it in a little bit of a chronological order. Let's begin with chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Now, that makes us different than any other creation on the face of the earth. The human being is the only one that has been gifted by God with the power of reasoning and logic. And we are made in his image. And that makes us very special to God. Now go over to chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And he became a three-part being. You find that in this verse. Then look at verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. God gave him honest work, toil, labor, and that is good for all of us. Then go down to chapter 2 and verse number 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. He had responsibility. He was accountable to God. Then go to verse number 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now, Adam was not born a dumb buddy. He was a very intelligent man to be able to name every creature that God had created. And God gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a hell meet for him. One of the reasons God created Eve out of the rib of Adam was so that Adam would not be a lonely man. And now look at verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. That was God using anesthesia for the first time. He must have had a special kind. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. 
God is our great physician. And here is the perfect surgery that he performed. He opened him up, he took out a rib, and he closed him up, and there was no scar left behind. And I don't think that Adam slept too long, maybe a little while. The anesthesia wore off pretty quickly. I'm using my imagination there, of course. Then it says, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he woman and brought her unto the man. I want you to notice that phrase. Made he a woman and brought her unto the man. I've tried to conceptualize that, that meaning. I tried to imagine what happened during that meeting. Now maybe Adam was just coming out of God's anesthesia when God brought Adam to, or God brought Eve to Adam. But when he saw that beautiful vision standing before you, it took him about one second to wake up. And I believe the first words out of his mouth was, why? I believe that it was love at first sight. <laughs> now, I, I'm not a great believer in love at first sight. Love is not a matter of feeling, emotion. It's a matter of the will. And I think that true love grows. Boy meets girl. Attracted to each other probably physically, first of all. Sight. But if they get to know each other, they like what they see. And the more they learn about each other, that affection begins to grow. And it goes to the place, finally, where the boy pops the question. And the girl says yes. Sometimes immediately, sometimes not. I met my wife in Bible college. It wasn't love at first sight. But I certainly was attracted to her. And so uh, I asked her for a date. We went to a school function. Then I got under conviction because I had a girlfriend back at home. <laughs> and I didn't feel right about two timing her. So I didn't ask Edith out anymore. And her roommate in school got very upset with me because I didn't. But when I went home that summer, I found out my girlfriend back home had another boyfriend. <laughs> so that made me free to come back and ask Edith for another date. We dated for several months, and then I asked her to marry me. She wouldn't give me an answer. <laughs> so, okay, I can wait. So I waited several weeks, and I asked her again, and she wouldn't answer me. So I waited a few more weeks. Then I said, I'm going to ask you to marry me one more time. <laughs> if you don't answer, that's it. She said yes. <laughs> now just imagine, Adam and Eve in the garden. They had no sin. And they had no clothes. And they did have love. It was a pure love. It was a holy love that they saw in each other. And I believe it came from God. There were no other human beings in the garden with him. But God was there. God shared every moment of their life. We're going to talk about that Wednesday night in detail. What was their life like? I don't know how long they stayed in the garden before they sinned, but it probably was a little while. And I think if you look at chapter 3 and verse number 8, it will give you a little hint or a clue as to what their life was like. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. 
By now, of course, they have sinned. But it seems to very reasonable to me that God had also walked with Adam and Eve in the garden before they sinned. If he did it after they sinned, it seems logical that he did it while they were still in their innocence. And what a beautiful picture that is. Just imagine Adam and Eve walking with God, talking with God, fellowshipping with God, experiencing God, loving God. And that's exactly what spiritual intimacy is all about. Amen. It's a man and a wife walking in close fellowship with God. There was a complete open, openness between all of them. There was a transparency. There were no secrets and no hidden agenda. Everything was open and above board. God became a partner in their marriage. And he became a member of their family. Spiritual intimacy. Let me read for you John 14, verses 19 to 20. That verse says this, and I think it's on the screen. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. What we have here is Christ in the Father, the believer in Christ, and Christ in the believer. So in the garden, it was not just Adam, he, it was not just Eve, she, it was not just God, him, it was we. Yes. We. Mm -hmm. And that, my friend, is what spiritual intimacy is all about. That was divine mutuality, family togetherness, spiritual fellowship, spiritual in in intimacy. Spiritual intimacy is all about God and, and man walking together in harmony with each other. Now let me ask you a question. How much does God have to do with your marriage and with your family? When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost that spiritual intimacy with God. But in Jesus Christ, that intimacy is restored again. Amen. And you and I have the distinct honor and privilege of walking with God. As a husband and a wife, as a family, including the children, we have that great privilege of walking with God in spiritual intimacy. Walking in spiritual intimacy is abiding in Jesus Christ. John chapter 15 and verse 5 states, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. And once again, husband and wife abiding with God equals spiritual intimacy. Spiritual intimacy is being filled and controlled by the Spirit of God. Ephesians 5.18 tells us, Be ye filled with the Spirit. And that means being constantly filled. Be, being filled with the Spirit on a regular basis. And to be filled with the Spirit means that we are under the control of the Spirit. Spiritual, spiritual intimacy is walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh. We read in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25, If we leave, live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Spirit
spiritual intimacy is Christ living in us. Galatians 2.20 declares, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So spiritual intimacy is a constant daily walk with God. It is not a perfect walk because sin still indwells us. The power of sin is still there. But as we seek God and wait upon Him and lean upon Him and look to Him and obey Him, then we will experience spiritual intimacy in our marriage. Each of us needs this in our marriage and in our family. Is that a part of your marriage and your family? There are some building blocks that make up spiritual intimacy. And I want us to consider them. First of all, safety. Safety. Now, there is vulnerability in spiritual intimacy. There is a risk involved in opening ourselves completely to our mate and to God. It's possible that we could get hurt. We think that the one we have chosen for life would never hurt us, but sometimes it happens. I think the staggering divorce rate in America and the number of couples that separate in the Philippines tell the story that there have been many who have been wounded because they open themselves up to their marriage mate. Now that's why safety is so vital in your marriage and in your family. You need to be absolutely sure in your marriage. Your marriage needs to be a place where you can both be yourselves. A place where you feel free to express your hurts and your desires and your dreams and and everything about you, your thoughts and your concerns and your fears, that's what marriage is to be. A husband and a wife sharing completely with each other. Both husband and a wife should feel safe in their marriage. I've said this before. Let me repeat it. My wife, my wife's heart is home for my heart. My heart is home for her heart. And I feel absolutely safe in that arrangement. Absolutely safe. Now safety is based upon trust. If trust is absent in a marriage, then it will be extremely difficult to build a lasting relationship together. Trust is something we earn by being trustworthy. I read about this husband and a wife, and this is a true story. The wife died in an auto accident. And after a few years, uh, the man decided that it was time to look for another wife. And so he began to look around and he began to court. He met and he fell in love with a, another lady and they planned to be married. However, due to conditions beyond their control, they had to wait almost two years before they could actually be married. Now during that time, that man never did anything more than give his fiance a good night kiss. After they were married, the woman beamed with pride at his behavior. She said, 